Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our third digital dialogue, which is part of the Global Arts and Humanities Society of Fellows program. The topic of today's dialogue is art, climate science, and the social condition. My name is Wendy Hesford, and I'm a professor of English and the present faculty director of the Global Arts and Humanities Discovery Theme. Today's event is sponsored by the Global Arts and Humanities Discovery Theme, which we often refer to as Got It for short, and our new Society of Fellows program. Let me say a few words about the Society of Fellows program because we're open now for accepting applications for next year's cohort. And this program basically offers OSU faculty course release to work on research. It also funds graduate and undergraduate student research and brings in external speakers uh, whose work help us critically engage uh, the annual theme for that year. This year's theme and what this di digital dialogue is a part of is called Extinction Imagination. And next year's theme, just for those of you looking ahead, is called Archival Imaginations. And information on applications for that cohort um, are available on our website. The Extinction Imagination theme is an interdisciplinary theme that invites us to consider extinction broadly. That is as a range of threats to ecosystems, languages, species, cultures, populations, and life ways. The theme also calls for a dual vision that attends to structural and embodied relations that contour extinction, as well as the role of the imagination in crafting sustainable responses to these threats and just responses to systemic inequalities. So in this uh, discussion today, I'm sure we'll be exploring some of these tensions uh, within the work of extinction and imagination. A few um, nuts and bolts about the format, given the size of the forum and to facilitate featured speakers contributions, we have set all of uh, the videos uh, on off and audios on mute, other than for the panelists and the moderator. The session is being recorded and will be available at a later date on our website. The dialogue will also be live captioned. Today's dialogue will be moderated by Dion Custer Edwards, who is the Director of Learning and Public Practice at the Wexner Center for the Arts. Thank you all so much for coming and thank you, Dion, for moderating. Thank you, Dr. Hesper. I acknowledge that the land the Ohio State University occupies is the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and Cherokee peoples. Specifically, the university resides on land ceded in the 1795 Treaty of Greenville and the forced removal of tribes through the Indian Removal Act of 1830. We want to honor the resiliency of these tribal nations and recognize the historical context that have and continue to affect the indigenous peoples of this land. Hi everyone and welcome. My name is Dion Custer Edwards and I am, I am the Director of Learning and Public Practice at the Wexner Center for the Arts here at The Ohio State University. I use she, her pronouns. My hair is brown and is pulled back in a ponytail. I'm wearing a dark gray sweater and a dark gray jacket. I'm also wearing black glasses. Today's virtual program will be recorded and will be available on the Global Arts and Humanities Discovery theme website at a later date. Joining me here via Zoom on your screen is Dean Amy Fairchild from the OSU School of Public Health, Hope Ginsberg, artist in residence at the Wexner Center for the Arts. Hope is also a professor at the Virginia Commonwealth University School of the Arts. Dr. Smith Rao, professor from the OSU College of Social Work and Sadia Raymond, artist in residence at the Western Center for the Arts. Sadia also teaches at OSU in the Department of Art. Collectively, this panel joins us today to consider the implications of today's rapid evolutions in intersecting social and environmental systems while imagining new realities for natural and social landscapes through action, activism, aesthetics, ethics, science, public policy, emotion, and civic and systemic change. 
Before we begin, I'd like to thank Global Arts and Humanities Discovery theme, namely Dr. Wendy Hesford, Dr. Pooja Bachelor Wells, and Brianne Lejeune for their support and for inviting us to convene for this discussion. I'd also like to thank Johanna Burton, thought partner, former Western Center for the Arts Director and current director at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles. I'd also like to thank current Western Center for the Arts interim co-directors, Megan Cavanaugh and Kelly Stevelt, along with colleagues at the WEX. In particular, Emily Haydit, Emily Euler, and colleagues in learning and public practice for their collaboration and support. To begin, we will have each panelist introduce themselves and share a bit of insight into how they are entering this dialogue today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Amy Fairchild, Hope Ginsburg, Dr. Smitha Rao, and Sadia Raymond. Dean Fairchild. Thank you. Thank you so um, much, Dion, and thank you for in inviting me here today. So I'm I'm I, I come here um, as multiple people. Uh, I'm the Dean of the, the College of Public Health. Um, I'm a historian and an ethicist who has most recently been thinking about um, a social history of crisis and, and panic and what it's meant over the past 100 years, 150 years, and the ways that we abuse and use notions of, of crisis and, and panic. Um, in addition to my university role as, as Dean, um, I've been helping uh, over the course of, pan of the pandemic to, to manage um, the COVID response on campus um, through making evidence-based decisions. So I've, I'm part of a, a big interdisciplinary team from across the university that on a daily basis is looking at all of the data that's giving us information about our health and trying to turn that not just into a set of recommendations, but a story that can help um, that, that can help guide decision making on, on campus. And uh, I also come as somebody who has tried over the years and increasingly in the context of the pandemic um, to play a public role, trying to change the conversation about public health, trying to make make people see and understand public health in a way that appeals to our, our better angels. Um, uh, but I also come to this moment because of all that as a, as a person who um, is, uh, is a little bit frustrated um, at, at times because of where we are in this pandemic and tired. Um, but uh, and, and particularly as I'm, I'm thinking strategically about the, the backlash, the potential extinction that public health is, is experiencing potentially at this, this moment. Um, but still, I have some questions that keep me uh, energized and engaged and even hopeful. And I'm particularly grateful for this opportunity um, because it brings me into conversation with other people who are energized and engaged. And so that helps to, to give me hope and sustain sustain my hope. So again, um, thank you very much. And, and um, to follow your lead, Dion, so I use she, her pronouns. I have short kind of messy hair um, and I'm wearing dark glasses that are actually made out of um, old vinyl records, um, which appeal to me because whenever I teach, I typically start and end with music because I find that to be an important companion to public health. Public health is about protest. It's about arguing about what matters, what we sometimes have to do to each other in the name of the common good and what we owe to each other in the name of the, the common good. So my glasses are a reminder of, of why I'm here and, and what I do. Um, and the, the, question I, the questions that are keeping me engaged and, and struggling these days um, have to do with the visibility of public health. And because I'm feeling a little bit jealous about some of the visuals that, that other people have, I'm going to go in the opposite direction for just a second and suggest that you close your eyes for a moment and ask yourself this question. When you think of public health, what do you visualize? And if visualization isn't, isn't your thing, if you can't visualize, um, what do you imagine? What story, what narrative captures not just the, the, the prospects of some of us, but the sum of us. How do we think in terms of a whole? How do we make what is so often visible, invisible, visible 
um, in a way that's that's not just highlighting all the things that are that are going wrong. So that's one of the questions. That's probably the primary question that I'm struggling with. Um, but in I'm hoping creative ways, productive ways, um, um, at this moment in in time. Thank you, Dean Fairchild. Hope. Thank you, Dion. Um, what an honor to be in this space with all of you. Um, I'm coming to you from uh, occupied Seneca Moco land in Richmond, Virginia. My name is Hope Ginsburg. My pronouns are she, her. I was not sure whether to say my hair was gray or salty salt and pepper, so I'll let you be the judge. Curly hanging below my shoulders. I'm wearing um, green on green and stripes on stripes. Um, I'm in my home office and there's a paper mache whale with people riding it, holding tiny sponges behind me. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Um, move some things around here so that I can see properly. And I'm showing you an image of a barrel sponge next to a star coral in a turtle, in a turtle grass meadow on the seabed. There's a crimson rope sponge and a tiny fish. I'm starting with this image of a sponge because it has been a great muse and inspiration to me in my practice for many years. It is the first multicellular organism and so not a great leap to say that it is an originating model of creativity. It is also a great exchanger, which makes it an interesting analog for teaching and learning. It filter feeds and breaks particles uh, from the water down and feeds other creatures on the reef. I learned to scuba dive so that I could see sea sponges. And what you're seeing here is an image from a body of work called Land Dive Team, in which eight people are meditating on, in scuba gear on sand in front of the Gulf of Mexico. This is the original land dive experiment in a body of work that went on to produce 14 more projects. And I'm going to describe uh, this work uh, in, in one specific way, and that is the proposals that it makes. And so this, this body of work proposes awareness of one's present moment experience without judgment as a way of attuning to the catastrophe of climate change. In this uh, image, three scuba divers sit in meditation in deep mud along the banks of what is now known as the James River, formerly Powhatan. Um, in this image of a land dive team, the, the river began to rise ever so slightly, which prompted the idea for this piece, Land Dive Team Bay of Fundy. Um, the images of four scuba divers meditating in a row, seated with the tide up to their ankles in the Bay of Fundy. Um, the divers sit in meditation as the tide, known to be the highest on the planet, rising and falling 50 feet twice a day at the head of the bay, which is the Minas Basin, um, as that tide rises over their bodies until they disappear, leaving only the evidence of their breath hitting the surface of the water in clusters of bubbles. And I'm going to play an excerpt of my excerpt. Pausing there, I want to um, note that this piece was edited at the film video studio at the Wexner, invited by curator Jennifer Lang and edited by Michael Lenick. The camera work is by Matt Flowers and Jessica Carey, and the score is by Joshua Quarles. Beep.
go back here. Um, in this image, uh, a still from the video swirling, also edited at the film video studio by editor and colorist Alexis McCrimmon. Um, you're seeing four divers surrounding a PVC tree-like structure with large clusters of staghorn coral suspended. Two of the divers float and two kneel, and they're trimming the coral to fill plastic laundry baskets on the seabed below. Uh, the piece proposes a laboring with other species for collective survival and habitat and economy resilience. And I'm going to show you now an excerpt of an excerpt again that has clips of fish, grunts to be specific, gathering in the suspended coral from the tree, divers entering the nursery, and divers working the coral in the nursery. The sound um, scored by Joshua Quarles is of um, divers bubbles, musical and, and digital, and the camera work is by my collaborator, Matt Flowers. This piece is a collaborative work. Okay, um, in this next image, uh, which is the installation view of swirling, uh, there are three large video projection screens suspended in a gallery in the form of a triangle. They carry three channels of video of coral being outplanted to the reef by divers, and two viewers sit on swivel stools in the center of the screens. I'm showing you this image before I introduce you to the last and final project that I'll share with you today um, because it portends the indoor ocean. That, um, that I, along with a constellation of collaborators, will make for this new piece supported by a Wexner Center Residency Award called Meditation Ocean. Um, this slide has two images. On the left, two divers sit in meditation on the seabed in the sand with turtle grass. On the right, a single meditating scuba diver floats in the lotus position above a coral reef. Um, a bit about MO. Um, it is once again a multi-channel piece that will fill a, a large gallery at the Wexner Center um, in 2023. Uh, this is a project that is supported again by a residency award in film video made working closely with Jennifer Lang and Alexis McCrimmon along with Dion of learning in public practice. That is because this indoor ocean um, is meant to be a, a platform, a porous platform for significant public programming for classes, workshops, dialogues. Um, there will be a porous group of meditation scripts that can be used to guide meditation in the gallery and also in the field. So the piece really um, endeavors to connect this far-flung uh, ecology to make it accessible to a broader group of people and connect it to local ecosystems. It's meant to be porous in the script space and in the workshop space, which um, can really be occupied by all manner of lenses, viewpoints, voices, not necessarily including my own. Um, all who join become part of this porous uh, multicellular MO constellation. Uh, I want to uh, wrap before I share a very short video of, from MO with the proposals that the piece makes, which are interdependence of individual and communal healing, deep connection between human and non-human well-being, the non-duality of the social and the environmental, as well as proposing a new milieu for awareness practice, specifically an interspecies awareness practice. So I will end with what I promise is a short clip just whipped up in the studio last week by the amazing Alexis McCrimmon.
Returning again and again to the sponge, thank you so very much. And I guess passing to Dion to pass the mic. Thank you, Hope. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Dr. Rao. Is everyone seeing my screen okay? Okay, perfect. Um, hey everyone, I'm so excited to be on this fantastic panel. Um, my name is Smita. I use the she and they pronouns. And I, my hair is short, uh, it's different every day, so it's straight today. Uh, I have dark brown eyes, I'm wearing a black sweater and a gray uh, jacket. And I'm sitting in my home office, but this is a four background behind me with a big tree, which I cannot kill, the only tree I cannot kill. Um, I uh, am an assistant professor in the College of Social Work at The Ohio State University, I'm new in Columbus. Um, and. I'm a social worker and a human geographer, and my work focuses mostly on human and policy dimensions of global environmental change. If it sounds broad, it's meant to be broad. Um, through my teaching, research, um, and you know, all my previous work experience, I have worked to highlight and examine the multiple dimensions of the distribution of environmental benefits and harms. And I'll be honest with you, when Dion first invited me to be on this panel, I my first reaction was, are you sure? I wrote a panicked email saying, I don't know anything about art. And Dion um, had wasn't the first time Dion was hearing something like that because she was very kind and she said, hey, that's kind of the point to bring together different disciplines, different thoughts and experiences to consider this uh, broader topic. Um, and when I thought more about this panel, I realized that that's not true, that I don't, it's not like art and me, we are so separate, right? Art is part of all of our lives, whether we actually engage in it or not. And it can take so many different forms as well. Um, for example, some of the most striking imagery or words that brought home the impacts of climate change uh, were art, were artistic. For instance, um, in the graphic in front of you, this is taken from the website showyourstripes.info that was very popular last year. It's based on a project by Professor Ed Hawkins of the University of Reading in the UK. And it is a visual representation of changes in temperature as marked in each geographical area over the past 100 years or so since the records have been started uh, being kept. So the stripes uh, run mainly from blue on the left to mainly red in more recent years towards the right, showcasing that average rise in temperatures over time. So this graphic here represents the changes in the United States. It has turned mostly from blue to red. And then the next picture, which is very similar, is Ohio. And we know from multiple readings and the climate science that the warmest seven years on record have all been since 2015. And these images kind of bear that out and start the conversation. So a lot of people were sharing this over social media last year uh, to say, hey, this is where it, this is how it is. And mostly it looked very similar. Another instance comes from Spain. Um, I think sometime last year, there was this eerie site that met many residents in Bilbao uh, in Spain, where there was an installation art by um, a Mexican artist, uh, Ruben Orozco. And basically, the idea was to encourage conversations about what he termed as actions that can sink us or keep us afloat. So there was this, um, the image here is of a fiberglass figure, a face of a girl, which submerges and uncovers every day as the tide rises and falls on the river in Bilbao. So it's a very striking image. Um, I've shared the YouTube link and a few other links. Uh, maybe that'll be put out in the chat if you want to explore how this looked with the tide rising and falling. And then there's this um, from Eastern India, uh, a tea tribe community leader, uh, Bhadra Rajwar. He's wearing a red sweater and a yellow turban. And oh, 
अरे बोस कांदी छे की सा महाजन के की दी बोजाबन आगो अरे बोस कांदी छे की सा महाजन के की दी and he's basically talking about how this is impacting his life how the floods that keep coming every year um are still kind of you know he still has to pay the taxes he still has to um you know pay the money lender so i think all this is really to say that art through songs through dances the written and the spoken word has always been that chronicler of change of imagination so i am entering this conversation energized and curious about how we as social scientists and artists can come together to work on this most important issue of our time because that's not something that i had actively considered but like i said the, the moment i started thinking about it i was like it's everywhere how did i not you know make that connection and i'm happy to actually look at um talk about concrete actions that we can take and you know you know who knows where this conversation will lead so that's where i'm coming from thank you sarya hello everyone um i see some familiar names in the viewer list so thank you for giving your afternoon to us um and i hope during the q and a we can um kind of break the barriers and begin talking with each other um hello i'm sadia rahman my brown hair is short and messy i'm wearing an earth tone zipped up vest and a black long sleeve shirt i'm joining you with you from my home the sunlight is coming in from the windows behind me and i am in front of my desktop I'm so honored to be here. Uh thank you Dion, Johanna, Professor Hesford, Emily, Brian, and Pooja for organizing us around the topic of climate change. Um until recently the natural environment did not enter my thinking or so I thought. Um but I like so many other people am now realizing that questions of the environment environmental justice and disaster is all around us and these questions are ones that we all need to think about and must be central to all the movements of our time including those around about and through art i will share my powerpoint now Okay, so hold on a minute. There's a shuffle. All right. So I've always been interested in the structures around us, family, nation, and border, or borders, um, and how those infrastructures impact who we are and the need and desire to take them apart. but also work within them to build different kinds of things in my work i deal with questions of inheritance building and taking apart this is an image of uh from my recent work titled the land of promise made directly on the walls of the columbus museum of art this is a detail of one of four doorways the ink drawing is made using stencils and hand drawn um wraps around the four doorways of the gallery space and also along the base of the gallery um in building this work i held workshops with the maroon arts group returning artists skilled and my osu life drawing class at the time we thought of how we survive by getting together in protest sport play and huddle to feed one another to find joy to dream and build by talking about these things both intimate and public we built our relationships with one another these were added to the our conversations were added to 
the drawings. The drawing records conflicting aspects of life today. For example, the Christopher Columbus Monument that was taken down from the Columbus City Hall in the wake of the George Floyd protests in 2020 and checkpoints at the US Naval facility at Guantanamo Bay where men are incarcerated even today almost 14 years after then President Barack Obama promised to close the facility. A basic set of texts from which I was drawing are the many protests of the last decade, both in Columbus and around the country, thinking about how oppressions and resistance work within infrastructures, community, history, and the present. When I look back at the work now, I notice traces of the 2016 protests of the Dakota Access Pipeline, started by indigenous people, water protectors, and land defenders. My new ongoing project, which will be shown at the WEX, more squarely engages with the environment. Here you see two images of the Tharbella Dam, the largest earth-filled dam in the world, and it resides on the Indus River. The dam regulates the water and generates electricity for a significant portion of Pakistan. The 1960s construction of this dam put 135 villages below water. It permanently displaced 100,000 100, people, including my grandparents, uncles, aunts, and cousins. While reading about dam construction and interviewing family members, I have started to see the connections between colonialism, development, and displacement, not just in Pakistan, but around the world. The Thurbella water level is at its lowest during the winter months. One of those moments is depicted here in this uh, photograph, where in the lower half of this photograph, um, it features a sunken mosque with partial minarets and also um, an archway. And you can also see the layers of brick that uh, used to be a floor plan of the mosque. There are shrines also um, underwater, but during the winter months, um, one can see them. And cemeteries. These are markers of all that has been broken, faded, dismantled, and of course, um, of those who survived. And I think I will end there and stop sharing. Thank you all. I'd like to begin really with this notion of um, visibility or really invisibility. Uh, at any given time, there's, there's a hum of chronic social conditions that include inequities across many intersectional identities and ways of being in the world. However, in this very moment, we seem to be existing in, in something more acute, uh, an enduring public health crisis, rapid environmental change, and elevated social upheaval and tensions, particularly around politics and social histories. Um, Dr. Fairchild really raised that notion and in the introduction. I'm curious what we aren't, with all of this going on and all of these intersections, what aren't we considering? What feels invisible in this moment? To me, the, the thing that feels invisible is the connections. So when I asked you that first question about what you visualized, you, 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 if you're thinking about pandemics, you're probably thinking about maps of the United States and purple, red, and and yellow, and we all that all carries meaning for us now. Or maybe you're thinking of masks, or maybe you're thinking of images of vaccination or images of protesters with sometimes with with firearms, but that's just a, that's a silo. And um, how do you connect that to um, the dams in Pakistan? How do you connect that to the oceans? How do you connect that to Guantanamo Bay? And one of the ways I think is narrative. And 
Sadia, as you were, you were talking, I was reminded that my, my work in history and ethics really began with Guantanamo Bay in the 1990s when it was Haitian immigrants with HIV who were detained there. So that's what I'm, and of course the image I, I have in my head is bridges, but to me, that's the challenge. How do we, how do we bridge and how do we get, how do we imagine collectively the whole at once and on the one hand, but then also how do we, how do we connect it to the, to values of communitarianism, of solidarity, of, of seeing ourselves as part of the whole and seeing our interests in the interests uh, in the health and well-being of, of other people. Can I just jump in here? Um, one uh, thought I had while all of you were speaking was how I heard words that we hear in the School of Social Work all the time. Um, and these are from public health and from art. Um, and it's interesting because I made a note, interdependence, um, you know, uh, connections, ethics and social history. I study disasters. So there is this element of crisis and panic and understanding how people are responding or preparing for that. And then uh, about borders and, you know, and about art, I think like a lot of people keep saying nature, the great artist, but that's an aside. Coming to the invisibility, um, you know, and what's invisible, I have a, like a few thoughts. Like I think Sadia, you named some of it because climate change at its root is kind of, uh, you know, stems from this exploitation and degradation of the planet, of people, um, and also of cultures. Um, and those were the same principles that, you know, kind of. Uh, gave birth to colonialism and imperialism. So that connect, um, I feel like it's not invisible per se, but it needs to be stated um, often. And because these are not kind of in vacuum uh, from each other, they're happening at the same time. And climate change kind of is this meta, um, you know, layer on top of all of those um, kind of systems of oppression. Um, another thing that feels invisible or not visible enough uh, is that a lot of the conversation on climate change, uh, the topic of, uh, you know, today, the climate science, climate science becomes a lot about 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees, about what the IPCC says. And sometimes, um, you know, while that's very useful and that has brought us to this conversation, as a social scientist, sometimes you have to go back um, to see what the human face of this climate change is and how it's affecting individuals, communities, groups in their everyday lives. Um, not to say that doesn't happen, but it doesn't happen often enough, except in the case of, say, an extreme weather event where you see images of you know, destruction. But what is the regular human face of people who are experiencing climate change day in and day out? So I feel that is another thing that can be more visible. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think what is erased are the um, communities and living beings um, who are impacted by the extract, you know, extractivist um, structures like, um, you know, even the military uh, for oil, lumber, gold, you know, diamonds, even the hydroelectric dams. And I think also what's um, erased is or what we don't see is our own entanglements um, in these systems. And, you know, uh, Smitha, um, you had mentioned, you know, uh, a visual just came in my head uh, with the December tornadoes, multiple tornadoes that had hit um, Kentucky and then five other states near, you know, neighboring states and what are the images that we see? We see, you know, the destruction of um, homes, buildings, um, you know, different infrastructures, and then it's the people, as if you know, the institutions or are the bones, or or these, you know, destruct destruction is the bones, the human remains of the environmental disaster. It's not the the um, you know humans or living beings. I just really appreciate everyone's comments so much. And, and I'm thinking about all the I words that are bouncing around the space, invisibility, interconnection, um, I'll offer interdisciplinarity, and then um, 
I, I think I'll, I'll, I lost an I word there that I really wanna, wanna mention, but I'll keep, I'll keep moving because that interconnection space, I think maybe what I wanna flag as invisible is our own nervous systems. And, and because there's so much a piece of my work that's about a mindful practice of attuning to what the nervous system is doing to sort of pull us as we interconnect and move back into social space, like back into our frontal lobes. And so our, our individual nervous systems either ground or upset a communal nervous system. And so entering the conversation with this perspective around mindfulness and kind of individual, there's another I, I word, individual and communal healing. I think I, I, think I just wanna call in the experiences of our bodies where we hold our traumas, where we hold violences committed by ancestors for some, violences perpetrated against ancestors for others or both. Um, so I guess, I, I guess I'm bringing my own somewhat um, escalated nervous system into the space and now I'll take responsibility for settling it a little bit. So hope I liked your calling out the I word to hope Deanna, I hope you don't mind my jumping in there. And I like that uh, somebody added infrastructure, but it, it also is the, the three of you are talking, the word immediacy came to mind that when, when something is, a, is a, a, a immediately a crisis, whether it's a tsunami. So I'm thinking about, uh, about our current crisis, uh, whether it's a pandemic um, that that's, that's, that's easier to visualize than maybe climate change, where as an individual, I can't, unless I see a graphic, the summer doesn't feel hotter to me than it did when I was three years old. I know rationally that that has happened. I know rationally that for the past almost 50 years in this country, we have seen health disparities worsen. We have seen, um, we have seen a deterioration in, in our health status as a whole compared to other nations, but that's it happens over because of the longer time frame that it happens over. Um, it's it it doesn't it doesn't grasp us as a crisis. It doesn't give us that you know wringing our hands moment. What's to be done uh, about this? And I think that's one of the challenges too: how to make some of these longer um, events that have a, a that have have deep historical roots and deep structures and deep infrastructure to them. How do we make us, how do we make ourselves see that as an immediate crisis? It really speaks to the question of um, um, that we that we received around how do we get the publics to feel less inert and more invested? How how do we begin to think about um, that I that individual, but really. Um, we are functioning in systems and structures. Mm -hmm. How do we begin to see ourselves as a whole? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll just chime in to say, I think it takes vulnerability and risk to move towards people to move towards each other. Um, how, how, do we, how do we attain that? Um, I also think maybe there's a bit of a conjuring of the role of art in terms of um, you know, showing people something to which they can emotionally resonate, which may move from a sort of supporter to someone who becomes active or maybe shows someone something that moves them from um, being a, a denier to a supporter. Um, but I think, I think, yeah, fascinating to think about what the strategies for further connection are. I'm, I'm also thinking based on how, what you just said about making, making that connection clearer or showing something about another I word, which I think we've kind of touched upon, which is imagination, right? Like looking at what can be or what can be. And I'm thinking this is, I, I need an excuse to talk about Octavia Butler, uh, you know, so 
I'm just thinking that that's uh, that to me is art, you know, that's storytelling. Uh, whatever she wrote in the 90s and the 80s, um, if you read it today, it feels prophetic. Um, and, you know, she's talking about racism. She's talking about climate change. She's talking about uh, if you read the parable series right now, um, it is she has imagined the world that we are living today. And it feels really spooky that she <laughs> kind of foretold the future. So that's the imagination. And a lot of times what she would say that her fiction, her storytelling, her art was all about if we go down this path, this is where we will reach. And we seem to have reached there kind of because her stories are set in 2024, which is not, you know, which is next year. Um, so, so I'm thinking about imagination as the tool to get people to think, to get people to act, to get people to remove those dichotomies of, you know, individual versus systemic change, because we are kind of intertwined, right? That's a dichotomy that doesn't really exist. We are bound in that system as individuals. Um, so that that's something that I can think of, like using imagination, using art, uh, therefore. Um, yeah, I would love to hear other folks. Yeah, and also um, with imagination, there is a connection to hope. Um, and we, you know, I think we need imagination to survive um, in some ways and also build um, different worlds. And so for artists, um, and this is also a question for me, but, you know, how do we lend our tools to um, the practices and to, you know, bigger collective projects of things that are already, you know, have foundations um, in organizing um, from, you know, abolitionist organizers to uh, the Sunrise Movement. Like how, what are the tools that we can lend um, to those areas? And, you know, speaking of inspiration, um, I love that you shared Octavia Butler, uh, Smitha. I'm inspired by, you know, the work of writers like Sarah Schulman, um, who had, just written the book, Let the Record Show, which speaks about ACT UP. Um, Andreas Mom, who has written How to Blow Up a Pipeline, um, artists like Emery Douglas. And so these are people participating in the movements and then they're using their tools, you know, their art practice to kind of meditate on the disruptions. And, you know, they participated in and produced work in, um, service of building those other worlds and imagining, and, you know, imagination. I might add another author writer to the list. Um, it's uh, Ben Okri, O-K-R-I, uh, is a Nigerian writer. Um, and he he called for what, what he termed as existential creativity. Um, and he basically called all writers, all artists to create art, and be creative like it's the end of time um, to speak the truth and find beauty in it. Um, so, you know, that's that's another interesting take on creativity um, because if you can't name it, you will not be able to, you know, take the steps to solve it. So Sadia, when you, when you talked about um... Um, the new social history of ACT UP, I, I couldn't help but thinking of Randy Schultz's and the band played on. And when you go back and read that, it, it feels counterintuitive because we do want to give people a sense of hope, but there also is a place for fear um, and instilling people with a sense of, of fear um, um, that that if we if we don't act, there are going to be some serious consequences. So one of the things I'd invite you to do is go back and look at that work and look at how 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 hard the community was trying to instill a, a sense of like, healthy fear in gay men and injecting drug users, certainly in politicians and in the American public. So and so I and I think too it it requires us not in a narrow, selfish way, but to understand our own self-interests and see those as, as fundamentally connected to others when we have 
a society which is this um, divided, this unequal, it actually, um, it actually detracts from the health of everybody. And um, in, in, so, so we need to have a sense that our own self-interests are interconnected with the interest of other people and, and having a society that, that treats people with something we would all regard it with a sense of fairness. Mm-hmm. I, do, I do wonder about um, fear and possibly even the role that it plays in us understanding this concept of obligation or commitment or um, you know, how, how one might activate themselves or be invested or interested um, in the context of um, crisis, in the context of uncertainty, um, this idea that fear might play a role, this idea that imagination also plays a role, these things intertwined at times, um, sometimes fear driving the imagination. Uh, what, um, what else? What else? How can we? I'm, I'm, I'm hearing an interesting vector around speed, around urgency, around imminence, and maybe a question about whether we move with the speed of, what is the sphere of feed, of um, fear and imminence? What is the speed of kinship? What is the speed of trust? And how, I mean, I, I just feel a question coming in about how we calibrate our speed and how we activate with awareness. What, what does that look like? And, and I'm curious um, for those maybe not, not working you know, in, the, in the arts, like how, how, does, how does speed get navigated in, 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 in public health, in social science around disaster? And, and when does it dis, disrupt productivity or, or what we wanna see? Because there's this, this idea that um, making room, right? If, if there is speed, if there is a sort of co- constant um, motion, and, and in some ways there is, um, but, but if we're sort of speeding through, say we're speeding through mourning or sorrow, um, how do we begin to sort of think about that? How do we begin to think about, um, there's some ideas in the chat around scale and dimension. Mm-hmm. And, and, and motion, this idea of, of motion, is there, um, is there something to standing still or beings being still? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what wisdom comes in through being before doing? I like that language a lot. Mm-hmm. And I see the comment in the chat about speed being aggression. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Speed being aggression and speed also sometimes being paralyzing, right? Like in terms of there's so much happening at breakneck speed, like climate change has been hurtling, you know, for a while now. It's been around, we've known about it since the 70s. I have been working on it for more than a decade. Um, it was a decade back when somebody sent me a song on climate change saying it's later than we think that that, that was 10 years ago. Um, so. I think that speed um, and in terms of you know work, uh, there are disasters happening every single day almost. I feel like and one cannot keep up with you know. Do you work on kind of the advocacy to make sure that there's mitigation happening at the federal level or at the local level, or do you go and study those populations who are not in the mood right now to be you know part of a research study because they are trying to find their homes again and that so speed can be quite paralyzing I think um, so I appreciate the idea of taking a moment but then do we have that moment uh, you know that there's also that do we have that time to uh, sit back and take stock uh, and then you know so that's that's a real tension um, especially when you're talking about climate change. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think too, in terms of time, do we take the time to organize? Mm. Um, and of course, most of my work is not thinking about climate change, but as I think about this moment in time, 
um, the anti-vaccination movement is very well organized. The the anti <laughs> the, the anti climate change movement is very well organized, and I think there is a big middle of us that um, are are science focused, who believe the science, and do we take the time to 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 engage in the same kind of organization uh, to to join groups to speak out on social media um, in in ways that that um, that that folks at the, the fringes aren't um, uh, are, are are doing and so it feels like that's one of the imperatives and maybe that's another I word is that that <laughs> that that um, the big middle of us have to feel a sense of investment in in some of these these social movements. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate this this idea of organize, organization and organizing um, around many of the things that we're talking about. I wonder what is the shape of organization? What what what's the shape of that? How do we begin to think of that in in some of the ways that we've been that we've been discussing earlier in terms of urgency, in terms of sorrow and mourning? Um, how does that begin to shape how we organize? There's, there's, a, there's a comment in the chat that notes that the impact of crisis fatigue on organi organization. How do you again and again and again? I think that's where you take a moment <laughs> and reconvene. Yeah, so I think that's that's something that a lot of uh, folks in social work talk about uh, burnout, and you know, because there's compassion fatigue, there's also uh, fatigue from the different uh, fights folks are fighting, whether they're working as direct practitioners or as policy advocates, or working with groups or um, housing organizations and at whatever social ecological level so that's I think that I guess where um, is where you take a pause you know I know self-care we've heard a lot about it and it sometimes can be triggering but Audrey Lord did say that it can be that radical act because you know it's a political act to take care of yourself and then sort of go back into the fray because it's a it's a long haul it's not going to it's it's almost uh, you know climate change has only come on top of every other uh, oppression that already was existing. Even if you take out climate change, the world was not perfect. And those imperfections are still there, far from perfect. So I think the fight to organize, to educate, to um, mobilize, I think that remains. So I think one uh, key factor could be classrooms. I'm a strong believer, like I come from, uh, in India, I went to school in a place which was very political we were all always you know up for protests and causes and inside the school and outside i see less and less of that um, here in the us i know on the west coast things are a little different but you know that those are the kind of mobilizations uh, that continue to happen even right now like the uc uh, campuses and harvard they've all divested because of students uh, protesting so there are ways to showcase organizing uh, for the climate uh, crisis or even allied sort of uh, oppressions and issues that folks are kind of fighting, fi finding common ground for. Well, that, that reminds me of one of the, I'm part of a, a group of people in public health talking about the future of public health education at this moment in time. And one of the themes that comes up again and again and again is we haven't trained people uh, in, in effective advocacy and effective communication techniques. That we've been, a, for a lot of our history, yes, there are people in health departments, and but, but for a lot of our history, we've been a research-oriented field. So journal editors and peers have been our primary audience. And 
it's not just that we need to reorient ourselves to think about our primary role as being changing the public conversation, but having the, 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 the practical tools and the skills taught to us, how do, we, how do we effectively marshal that data? How do we help people visualize? How do we communicate that in a way that, that doesn't take this whole mass of knowledge that we have, but just those pieces that are gonna be relevant to somebody based on their, their values and their orientations. What is it that's gonna resonate? So that's the discussion we're having in, in public health at a national level is, is um, thinking about systematically making that a fundamental part of public health education in a way that it really hasn't been. And I guess what I'm hearing is that, um, like, you know, what if there can be both? where we hold urgency and move slowly, and then also add in repetition um, in terms of, you know, it's not like we're inventing uh, this quote, we're inventing the wheel. We're building, you know, we're building on top of a translucent layer where we're, you know, it's, there's a, already a foundation um, speaking of, I think, Hope had mentioned ancestors, like we're, we have that foundation and then the repetition of just building a transparent layer um, in terms of, you know, borrowing from what has already been done and disseminating it, um, acting on it. Um, so there is this, it can, I think it can be both urgency and slowness and repetition. You know, how does art show up in this space? How does humanity show up in this space, right? How do we, you know, particularly as, as, um, as Dean Fairchild talks about um, research and then realizing, oh, well, we, we need to be able to disseminate this. We need to be able to communicate this in a way that um, people will respond to, that will impact people. This is data, this is important. It's, it's important to, that you know this, but how can you know it? How do we know these things, right? How do we know these things about public health? How do we know these things about how our climate is changing? How do we know these things about the social dynamic? I'm not gonna answer that question, I'm gonna add a question to it, but in all of these fields, how do we, it, th there's so much we don't know too. We don't, there, there is contested evidence. There are different paths forward. And that's part of what we have to navigate, that their information's evolving, there are uncertainties, and we have to move, we have to be able to move forward and make decisions in the face of uncertainty, in the face of contested evidence, in the face of conflicting evidence, in the in the face of evidence, evidence gaps. So that's one of the other challenges that we face. So I don't think you I, so I don't think you can do it without art, but I don't think you can do it without values and ethics either. And, and I think we tend to think about evidence as telling its own story, speaking for itself, but it requires translation through, um, through values, through, through our particular moment in, in time, through aspirations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I love that point about sort of conflicting evidence because art is such a space of ambiguity. So it's a space where we can move toward content, move toward engagement, and not have to have a, a, a specific outcome or, or um, you know, clear, boiled down something. And so that's an interesting place that art can work in tandem with new knowledge to sort of represent it in, in states of ambiguity. I also think that art is a space for um, modeling propositions, right? It, it, it can be a bit of a, of a wide open space where where we're modeling practices can take place that can be either very actual, very real, like, you know, really, it doesn't have to be representation, it can be presentation, it can be really going after the goal, but there's also um, a, a symbolic capacity there. And also the capacity to be both real and symbolic at the same time. I mean, here, I think about the 
the coral restoration project. And I'm just exploring the notion that in some ways it's, it's really happening, but how, how much can it be scaled up or how is it a kind of symbolic and inspiring catalyst for further action? So I think that's another place where art and the disciplines can come together is what are questions around scale? What can, what can art incubate free of certain disciplinary constraints that can then engage in dialogue with other disciplines and be scaled up? And how do we in our interdisciplinary, innovative, I, you know, now the I can't stop the I words, you know, really seize upon that potential? Well, there's this scaling up, but then there's this other kind of scaling too. There's an interesting question around what role um, does limiting scope play mm -hmm. in advancing causes that that we feel are important. You know, how do we effectively take charge of information intake? Um, how things are affecting our systems? Um, how we get through the day? How do we sort of think about scale in that way and, and scope in that way um, so that we can care? about there's a pressure to care right and there's um and and there is this sense of ethics right mm -hmm. there is this sense of what you know what do we care about how with such sheer volume how do we think about scope how do we think about well just caring about all of it how do we think about volume how do we think about being overwhelmed um our systems are getting through just our daily lives just functioning at a base level, actually. Yeah, and the yeah, and the other way I'm thinking about this is I think we have such we feel such pressure to be transformative. So I'm gonna read you something somebody sent me the other day when I was kind of feeling like uh -oh. I haven't I haven't done anything. And it's it's from Hamilton. And there's this song called The World Was Wide Enough. And there's a, a section in it that reads legacy. What is a legacy? It's planting seeds in a garden you will never get to see. I wrote some notes at the beginning of a song, somebody will sing for me, America, you great unfinished symphony. So I think that we have to, I'm getting emotional because mm -hmm. somebody shared that piece of art with me at a moment where I was feeling fragile and it helped. And it mm -hmm. helped me remember, I don't have to be transformative. I just have to plant seeds. I have to take some steps. And I think that's one of the, the lessons that we need to, to bring to this as individuals. And even as movements, we're not going to be transformative. But if we can plant seeds, if we can take ourselves some steps forward, then then that's then that's the that's the path we need to be on. I also love the capacity for art to allow us to feel this, to feel it in a way that other spaces might not allow. Arts and humanities allows us a space to feel our bodies in crisis, our bodies in mourning, our bodies in overwhelmed by just the sheer volume of it all. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and, I don't know that a graph has ever made me feel so. <laughs> <laughs> and so there is this role, right? There is this role when, when we begin to think, well, what is art, humanities? What does this have to do with anything? Um, we begin to think, oh, it's, it's already here. It's already present. Are we are we paying attention? That goes back to that that invisibility, mm -hmm. and back to the body. I like the tagging again of the our our our, our bodies in this mess together. Oh, our bodies in this mess together. Can you say more, Hope? Yes. Yeah, this is, I think, I think I just go back to what, what we're all navigating, our porous bodies, our messy bodies, our, our anxious bodies, our, our crying bodies, our energized, activated, elated bodies, our bodies that have conflict, our bodies that can come together. And, and to your point, Dion, you know, in terms of art registering emotion or feeling, we do that in our bodies. And, and I think they also cue us when to act if we're paying attention. I think if we can, you know, we're all, we're all thinking, researching engaged minds, and yet that's not always the best tool for the job. And, and oftentimes if we drop into our body, it has the information we need about who to move towards and how and when to stay put. And so I like, I like conjuring the body 
in the space of art and our shared messes, plural. There's some great questions around advocacy, advocating around the health of humanity, around the well being of humanity. Um, I wonder if you all have elements that you find meaningful, tools, um, practices that you find meaningful, effective. You've shared some of the things that you've, that you've been inspired by. Um, what do you find is moving advocacy forward, moving communication forward? Maybe everything's moving around us and we, and we are really. Well, I, th I think we can, it, we can tend to think of advocacy as taking place in a public hearing or taking place at a march. And, and I, th I think one of the things it requires is to, or contributing your money to this cause or that cause or your, or your time. But I think it also happens in smaller spaces too. Um, you know, even on Facebook, because we've all got Facebook friends or Twitter social media friends or neighbors who don't share our views and um, and I, I think we need to find ways to and this is a, a line from Claudia Rankin how, how do we stay in the conversation with people but it, it requires having some of these uncomfortable conversations and and not just in not just in big spaces because that's not going to be for everybody but when your neighbor says something that's that's clearly wrong. How do you engage in that conversation and bring that and, and keep that person in conversation to keep them open to hearing uh, another point of, of view? And it may not be it may not be throwing data at them or throwing information at them. It may be asking them questions about how did you come to that mm -hmm. belief? Why did you think that's true? Well, that's interesting because I looked that up and then you know I found that you know. That, that's not actually that's not actually the, the case and um, um, so so I, I think it's it, having a robust view and a nuanced view of advocacy is part of the solution if all of us are really going to be engaged in it in some way hmm. yeah and uh, you know I used to teach a course on social policy uh, to MSW students and one of the core uh, aspects of that was actual going out there and advocating on the at the Massachusetts State House. Um, and just, I think, demystifying that process of uh, who you're electing and why they are actually there to serve you was uh, something that was very powerful. Like a lot of students, like especially the younger students, they don't want to you know, call anyone. Nobody calls anyone anymore. So making them call the senators or the legislators offices and having them book an appointment with them which was easy to get but they did not know that because they won't they did not want to make that call um, so that was one example where just demystifying that process of you know they're there to listen and they will listen if you have an appointment um, if you're a constituent for example but the conversation just before this also reminded me that you know having that conversation so art I think can be that conversation starter because art is also about another I word interpretation, right? So um, you just, for social scientists, uh, we are trying to understand the human, the non-human condition better. And I think art can sometimes maybe be the communication tool uh, for people to express themselves and also for people to begin talking. Uh, maybe there is you know, subliminal sort of indirect messaging to be done or interpretations, for example, that the drowning girls, uh, you know, installation in Bilbao, many people had different interpretations. And it was only after the artist said that, hey, this is about sustainability and climate change, but others were having, you know, different interpretations that maybe something happened, maybe it can be a conversation about, I don't know, intimate partner violence, or, you know, mental health, you know, it could be conversation starters. Uh, that I feel can be really useful in bridging that gap of, uh, you know, bringing these different interpretations together and really trying to understand that human and non-human world that we are inhibiting. 
Smith, yeah, what I you're mean, saying? I, oh, I, <laughs> um, I, I agree. Um, conversations in groups and, you know, one-on-one -on -one, um, is really great. And, you know, humanity, amazing. I agree with all of that. Um, and then also, you know, Hope mentioned having a visceral emotional experience with an artwork. And so, you know, I always remember those those artworks, like, you know, particular artworks that give me this emotion or visceral um, experience, um, you know, specifically thinking of Arthur uh, Jaffa's uh, seven minute video, Love is the Message, the Message is Death. Um, and very briefly, it's, you know, a seven minute really mesmerizing video. I think I saw it last at the Denver Art Museum. Um, there's sound, um, uh, the, the sound is uh, Kanye West's um, ultra light beam um, track. And then the images, I'm just looking at my notes, <laughs> the images are, you know, found footage that, you know, traces African-American identity through a spectrum of contemporary imagery. So that's, you know, photographs of civil rights leaders to helicopter views of the LA, LA, LA riots, Los Angeles riots of the 90s, and then people dancing. Those are some of the found footage. Mm -hmm. um, but the question that I'm wondering about, um, speaking about, you know, these conversations and these connections and this conversation that we're having is, you know, what is, who is this panel? Like we are all affiliated with an institution, Ohio State. We are um, participating in the formal art world. You know, I certainly do. Uh, what is the art that we are talking about? And the question that has continued to go into my head um, as an artist is how do artists make radical art to address concerns of the climate crisis? Is this art interchangeable with art shown in museums, um, nonprofit spaces, uh, commercial galleries, and funded by the very corporate sponsors we are speaking against? And I think I can open that up to academics and social workers and historians as well. <laughs> I, I don't know the answer. I, I, yeah, I've just been wondering that as an artist. Sadia, I, I love that question. I might, I might uh, offer a response and then also would love to hear your response because I know you've been thinking about it too. I mean, one thing that I just want to jump in with right away goes back to the notion of scale. Like how do we make our work at different and variable scales with the resources that we have so that we're empowered to make our work when we're making it um, with our community, without institutional support, but when there are opportunities to partner with an institution and to draw um, energy from those collaborative relationships, how do we use those opportunities to, to redistribute resources, to, to bring other partners in, to share and expand the platform. I mean, this gets to a kind of ethic of collaboration, um, but just some off the, off the rip thoughts about how we can simultaneously work within and without of the institution and what some of the benefits of, of partnering with institutions are. Another I word. Yeah, thank God I forgot that at the beginning because it's just given us this great open space to lob I words all day long. <laughs> what are all these I words? Can we? Well, we should them? change them to we. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. <laughs> sorry. What are some of these I words? Because I do feel like even in these these last few moments, just even recalling them feels um, feels valuable. Yeah. Right. There was impermanence and intersections, uh, invisibility. I really want to, I really want to put my, my money on interconnection. Yeah. 
interspecies. Mm -hmm. Imagination. Mm, yeah. Imagination. Infrastructure. You Infrastructure. saw in the chat. Yeah. Thank you for that. Interdisciplinary, innovative, interdependencies. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, the, you know, the concept of the imagination is also very common in social sciences. So the social science imagination is often used as this tool uh, to, we say it in social work all the time, to make the invisible visible. So, you know, Dean Fairchild, you said something very similar in the beginning. So I think uh, the idea that imagination, the interpretation, the impermanence um, permanent. A lot of that is such an important part. I think I'm, I'm going to note down all these I words as well to dwell on it a little more. Yeah, and I would add the I words that we need to combat like inertia. Somebody said that uh, early in, in, the, in, our, in our discussion. And I think too, maybe a sense of indignation um, mm -hmm. needs to be part of this as well. Love that inertia, indignation, intersections. Yeah, I love thinking about what we can put down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Immediacy, someone just shared that. Mm -hmm. Immediacy, all of this is quite immediate. Mm -hmm. And mobility. I do love this collective thinking we're doing. There's mm -hmm. something about really building community around um, language, mm -hmm. around sound, I words. And I think thinking in, ter in intergenerational terms is going to be important too. If we think about um, the, the 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 long haul, it's mm -hmm. it's not just us. It's the we, we do this not just for us, but for the next generation, but they have to take up the torch too. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to invite that? There's another I word. <laughs> Is there another way to invite that, to, to extend an inv invitation? Um, someone spoke in the chat of the idea of gatekeeping. How do we invite, include? Mm, include. How do we be more inclusive? What does that require us in the here and now to be more inclusive? Indigenous, thank you, Sadi. Indigenous, absolutely. I, I know you didn't mean this so literally, Dion, but I am happy to invite people to a Monday morning guided mindfulness sit that I do every week at 9 a.m. It's totally open, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard. And um, uh, I think there might be a Zoom link to pop into the chat for that. Yeah, so please join and, and please come check out the ocean and hang out in our indoor ocean that'll be at the WEX um, imminently. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um, I would, just love to thank Dean Fairchild, and Hope Ginsburg, and um, Dr. Smith of Yat Rao, and um, Sadia Raymond. Uh, I'm left thinking about so many things, particularly all the I words. I do hope that we are capturing the chat. It's it's lush and it, it has some really beautiful quotes but then also it's full of language that we've been using and there's something about continuing to sort of call on that. And I hope that that continues to linger. Um, thank you all for joining us uh, today for this discussion on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, I hope that, that uh, you have been moved or affected or impacted or, or you're left thinking about something, you're left asking more questions. Thank you so much, uh, Global Arts and Humanities Discovery Thing for inviting us and, and really giving us a space to be able to uh, collectively think about 
this, these topics. But and thank, yeah, thank you, Dion, for terrific moderation of what was a fabulous and intimate, even though I realize we're a pretty big group conversation. Uh, I don't know about others, but at a day which was has been very exhausting, a time, a year that has been very exhausting. Um, I mean, even just sharing the I words is a kind of collaborative meditation that I appreciate this afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for that dialogue. Thank you so much to all of the speakers and contributors and all of those in attendance. Have a great evening.